Hello and welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Gary Day from Lehigh and Berks Counties. Welcome to the show today, our Secretary of Transportation, Barry Shoke. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Representative. It's good to be here. Thanks for being here today. I think it's really important. We have uh, what I consider to be a key function of government you're in charge of in the Commonwealth, and the governor's put his faith into you uh, to lead the department and work on his cabinet to, to lead the transportation uh, maintenance, uh, you know, whether it's repair and maintenance, as well as new construction and new need for new capacity throughout the Commonwealth. And I think it's important that our viewers know a little bit about you. So could you start off by explaining who you are? How did your career bring you to this point? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's been a surprise to me, I guess, to anyone who's in this position. How on earth did you get to this position of being Secretary of Transportation? Um, for me, it uh, started at Penn State. I'm a civil engineering graduate. Uh, graduated high school down near Gettysburg with an interest in math and physics. So all the, the students out there that are watching this that have an interest in math and physics, uh, who knows where it could lead. Um, but I went into engineering, graduated with a civil engineering degree. Uh, interned with the Delaware Department of Transportation, which is sort of where I got my interest in transportation. Uh, civil engineering is a pretty broad field, but I got interested in transportation. And graduated, came to work in Pennsylvania, and have been working for 28 years uh, with private consulting firms, uh, working for DOTs and other owners of transportation systems uh, in design, uh, policy, uh, in construction, in planning for transit agencies, highway departments, state DOTs, up and down the East Coast. So it's uh, been a long, interesting career in all in transportation. Was that mostly in the private sector? All with, in the private company? sector. Okay, all so in the private sector. now in the private sector, I know that you work with many different public entities in transportation. So you had a view from the outside of, of PennDOT and as well as other transportation organizations. How did that help you uh, to, to want to come in and take this job and, and lead the department? Well, I, it's, uh, it's interesting. When I go uh, and, and talk to our staff at PennDOT, which is 11,000 people, so although I worked with the agency for my entire career, there's a lot of people I'd never met. And I told them all that uh, having worked with a lot of DOTs, as you said, up and down the East Coast, it gave me an opportunity to see what each agency did, how they did it, and uh, what I liked about it. And I always felt that PennDOT was a leader uh, nationally in their approach to dealing with construction, design, and maintenance. And, and it's true, we frequently get asked to go speak at AASHTO events, uh, which is the organization of all the other DOTs, as to how we do our emergency response, no response, the flooding, uh, the response to flooding. Um, so it gave me a big advantage, I think, coming in, knowing the agency a little bit, and then also knowing other agencies, having the benefit of some experience elsewhere to bring to the table as well. Now, the Commonwealth is split up into districts, is that right? I'm going to you know, ask you to explain that a little bit as well. We're in District 5. It's a five, I think it's a five-county geographic mm. region. It includes Berks and Lehigh as well as other counties around that area. And uh, we've made some changes in that district to, to, to make maintenance better. We've had, we had a big problem uh, about five years ago out on 78. Uh, although we can't control Mother Nature, uh, we, we put in processes in that district to make that better. We're also doing, we, we took advantage of dollars, federal dollars, to do much more in the district as well. Can you just explain the district uh, uh, structure of PennDOT? Sure. We, uh, we're set up in, uh, we have a central office which does our policy and our materials and our design guidelines and, and supports for the district, but we basically do the work uh, on the projects out at our districts, which are 11 different districts, as you say, multi-county uh, regions broken up through the state where we have staff that's there to design the projects, to work with the legislators, the public, uh, and the individual projects so that we have hands-on people who know that district very well um, that can deal with the individual problems related to that part of the state. One of the interesting things about this state is we have a lot of different geographic um, issues to deal with and topographic issues. So what we might do in, in Philadelphia in that district is totally different than what we might do in Erie, both in design, materials, etc. So while we try to standardize, I think it's important and, it, and it's good that we have the different districts split up to deal with the individual problems of the constituents in that region of the state. Okay, now let's talk about transportation across the entire state. Where we are now, we're going to get to talking a little bit about the commission, but can you explain for our, our, our viewers the, the, the transportation situ situation as it is right now? Uh, let's talk about uh, maintenance, let's talk about new capacity a little bit, but the, but the big picture of Pennsylvania, and also where are we with traditional revenue sources? 
Well, let's, let's sort of start with maybe a state of the state of mm -hmm. transportation, if you will. Um, we, and I say we, meaning everybody who's watching this, we collectively own 40,000 miles of road and 25,000 bridges here at, within PennDOT. And uh, the, just to focus for a moment on bridges, most of this system was built a long time ago. The average age of our bridge, average age, is 50 years old. Now think about that. For all the new ones we've built, and we've put about 400 bridges out a year for the last four years, right. for every new bridge we have two that are 75 years old. Mm -hmm. Now it doesn't take an engineer to know that that's not good. Um, <laughs> that means that the age of the materials are such that uh, they're starting to wear down and they need significant replacement uh, and a lot of work. And, and the same is true of our pavement. Um, you see us doing a lot of overlays. What we should be doing is new construction, meaning rebuild the entire road, to take it right down to the base right. and rebuild it because it's over 40 years old. We can't really afford to do that with our current revenue streams, so we do surface work. Um, it's a little bit like, I, I liken it to putting paint on bad wood. Looks good for a while, right. but then the bad wood starts to surface. And you probably see that if you're driving through our uh, projects, you'll notice that if we put an overlay down, you know, the first time we do it, it might last eight years. Then we'll come back and it might last five years. That's right. because the pavement underneath is old enough that uh, it, it hurts the surface. And, and let me just ask you the question, the, the, the common sense connection is like the repair or replace of your vehicle, is it, yep. where you can, many times the regular you know, person in, in my district, a lot of people do have automobiles and, and you have that decision to make. So it's the same decision same where thing. we can put $500 more into our car or we could put $500 more into a new car. Now, the point I want to make there is we can continue to paint the bad wood for a short period of time. It, that is a strategy for a short term, but not a long term. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, you know, the issue is, uh, I think, I call it a generational responsibility. Um, this system was built, you know, by our parents and grandparents, and now it's our turn to take care of it for the next generation. If we don't, if we keep doing the, the nickel and dime repairs, all we're doing is giving a bigger bill to our kids. Right. And that's something I feel very strongly about. I'm a father, and I, I don't want to sit, tell my kids that while I was Secretary of Transportation that I punted on this, and it's going to cost them more. And just to put some numbers to that, uh, when Governor Rendell came in, he did a funding and reform commission study. They identified the spending gap at $1.7 billion. Today it's $3.5 billion. Why? Well, we didn't do anything. It's a lot like, I'll give you another example. You mentioned a car. All of us, when you get out of college or you're first getting out starting, you might use a credit card when you shouldn't. Right. You build up a big balance, you make a minimum payment. Well, what happens? The balance gets bigger because you're not making any headway. That's sort of what we're doing with our transportation system. We're making minimum payments on it, and in the end, it's just going to cost more each time we put it off. Okay, so we've, we've, we've looked at this. We, we identified it in previous administrations, not just the Corbett administration, um, and, and everyone pretty much knows in, in transportation, in the public sector and the private sector, that we need to do something about that. So the governor comes along and he, and he puts together a commission. Now, uh, and, and I believe you were the chair of that Plus, commission. So true. you led that, that commission. And that commission's, let talk a little bit about the charge of that commission, the, the composition, the makeup of the members, and uh, just, just start there. Well, the charge of the commission was not to study the problem again. The governor and I both agreed this problem's been studied to death. We, we agree with the fact that we're underspending by, you know, three to three and a half billion dollars a year. The question is what to do about it. Uh, and, you know, I, for you and every other elected official, you think, how on earth could we get to a $3 billion spending gap? Well, it doesn't happen overnight. And the governor and I both believed, you know, you, you don't try to get out of it overnight. Uh, we're not ready to spend $2 billion more a year. We're not designing projects to that size or schedule. So you want to try to ramp up to, to work your way out of it. So the charge to us was to build to the, to the tune of two to $2.5 billion uh, of new revenue that we could spend on transportation over a five-year period so that we could start building back up the spending to match our ability to deliver projects. Uh, the makeup of the commission had industry representatives from private sector in, in both construction and design. It had county and local government. It had rail uh, expertise, uh, transit expertise, um, and air expertise because we have a multimodal system. It all ties together. We need mass transit. We need rail. We need airports. Right. Um, so we had all the modes represented, all levels of government, and the private sector. And it was a 40-person commission charged with coming up with a responsible way to finance this problem. Okay, so I, I know a lot, working in my district, I know a lot of the viewers that are watching the show now say, uh, well, we don't have to increase taxes to get this. Let's get it from elsewhere in the budget. And I, I just want to share with the viewers and, and with you as well, I believe a lot of myself and a lot of my colleagues are working toward that. We're looking at 
waste, fraud, and abuse is a phrase that you hear in, in all levels of government, uh, all spending in government. So I think it's important that I, I step up here and answer a couple of questions too that I know people are shaking their television right now and, and, and thinking about because they tell me that in the, hundred, in the 187th district as well as throughout the Commonwealth with some of my colleagues. So we are looking at that, but it, it still is a big amount in the budget. I mean, if you talk about two and a half to $3 billion of what the need is uh, for infrastructure, can you talk a little bit about the difference in uh, revenue as how it was, there were certain things that were capped. Uh, mm -hmm. Motor fuel tax is based on fuel consumption. We've had a big movement over the last 30, 30 years to lower consumption through higher miles per gallon. So can you explain a little bit about that, how normally um, a, a tax can continue to sustain spending, but, but in our case it may not be doing that? Yeah, we're, we're fortunate in, in one way in Pennsylvania that we have a motor license fund that is dedicated so that people know that when they pay their registration, license fees, and gas taxes, it can only be used for highways and bridge. Other states are not like that. That money goes to the general fund and can be used for highways and it can be used for other things. So I think for all the viewers to know, we're a little bit like a utility company at PennDOT. Uh, everybody has a cell phone, everyone has a you know, water bill, uh, everyone has a, a cable TV. We're kind of similar to that in that we are set up like a utility. We charge you for access to the system, which is your registration and license fees. And then we charge you for how much you use the system, which is gasoline taxes. The more you drive, the more gasoline you consume, the more you use. It's not much different than a cell phone bill or other utilities that people are used to driving. Interesting, for everybody watching this, if you think about how much you pay for cable television or your cell phone, I, I, I ask this question a lot and people say $75 or so on average. For a person that drives about 15,000 miles a year, their bill for us is about $30 a month. Compare the two. Um, you know, they're not, you think about what you could live without. Right. But our, our source of revenues, as you say, are based on primarily on gasoline consumption. And if you think back over the last 30 years about what's happened in the average fuel efficiency of a car, I, I often tell the story when I graduated college in 82, my first car was a 77 smoking abandoned Trans Am. <laughs> a lot of fun to drive, uh, you know, the crushed floor interior, T tops, and all that. Eight track you, stereo. You could hear the you could hear the gallons. <coughs> you could watch the gas gauge go. But you know, most people in the 70s and 80s were driving big block cars. Today, uh, you know, a big car like a Chrysler 300 gets 31 miles to the gallon. So for everybody out there driving, even if you buy the exact same vehicle each time you buy a new car, if you're wedded to one kind of car, when you buy it three years later, it's going to get better fuel mileage. That's a good thing. Reduces our reliance on foreign fuel, better for the economy. Right etc. But it means we get less revenue per vehicle mile driven. So that's what's happened. Our, our, our revenues have eroded, meaning each person out there that's paying us, you pay us less today than you paid last year and the year before and the year before that. Each time you get a new car, it's more fuel efficient. You're driving the same miles, but you're paying less of a fee for the exact same use of the roads. Right. <clears throat> Let's take a quick break and we'll be back in a moment with our guest today, Secretary Barry Schock. I'm State Representative Gary Day and Legislative Report will return in a moment. Did you know that in the corridors in the first floor of the capital of Pennsylvania there are nearly 400 individual mosaics? The idea for creating these intricate tiles was first suggested by Henry C. Mercer in 1902. A year later, he received the commission to prove 16,000 square feet of pavement tiles for the Great Rotunda and corridors of the new State Capitol Building in Harrisburg. Mercer set about designing subjects for approximately 400 mosaics. He chose as his general theme the history of Pennsylvania, and he soon realized that his tiles could tell stories. Although the arrangement seems random, the mosaics are very thoughtfully placed in the floor. The tile sequence is roughly chronological, beginning at one end with the scenes depicting the Native Americans. The mosaics progress into the story of European habitation in the New World and encompass the Commonwealth's triumph through process and intervention. Now you know. Well, welcome back to our program. My guest today is Secretary of the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation, Barry Shoke. We're discussing transportation funding, and right now we were at a point where we were talking about the Governor's Commission for Transportation Funding. And the Secretary 
was talking about how this commission's charge was not to say, is there a problem, but to say, how do we fund uh, you know, a budgetary shortfall in what we need, what we project um, to need for transportation. And I've already made the comment, and I say it over and over again, if there's one thing I was sent here to do, a basic core function of government, it's transportation. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit, just open the, the, the second half of the program up a little bit with what is this commission charged with, and, and we'll get into some of the results. Well, I think that the primary charge was to figure out how we should finance this. As you say, it's a basic core mission of government, and, and as we've already discussed, it's a generational responsibility. If we put it off, it's not going to get less expensive, so we're not doing anyone any favors by not dealing with it. You aren't, I'm not, uh, and for everybody out there in the public, uh, as much as no one wants to pay more today, do you want to charge your kids twice as much because you weren't willing to do so? Or do you want to be charged twice as much? In a lot of ways, I often say government's charging them when we don't take care of the problem. If you're sitting in congestion and because we're unable to add capacity to fix the problem, we're charging you. Uh, we're charging you in the form of more fuel consumption. If you're driving around a posted or closed bridge, we're charging you. So we can either charge you to fix the problem or we can continue to not charge you and the problem will get worse. Uh, and more expensive. So our charge was to figure out how we should actually finance it. And then also, I think equally as important, you mentioned earlier about looking for ways to save money. Um, we charged this commission to tell us uh, ideas on things that we could do to modernize the agency and modernize our approach to delivering projects that would reduce costs. Uh, reduce costs for us, reduce costs for consumers. Uh, for as simple as, for instance, going from a one-year registration to a two-year registration and possibly eliminating the stickers because a new technology, the police can actually use uh, their onboard computers to, to determine whether your license plate, uh, your car is registered. That means people could register online and go every two years, which saves our customers money, saves us money. Going to an eight-year driver's license would save us money, save customers money. So we charged them with a component of how can we modernize our approach, save money, and then on the flip side, how can we actually raise the revenue necessary from our users, again, keeping it consistent with the concept of user fees. Um, to finance transportation and begin to build our way out of this. Well, and I thought, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because when I was preparing for this program, I was trying to remember and then it finally dawned on me what you had said during the Appropriations Committee meeting about how congestion charges us. And for me, I, I, I don't know, I think it's the same way for a lot of people who travel quite a bit. Uh, for me, just time wasted standing in line uh, I'm so much happier when there's no one else on the road and I can proceed yeah. at, you know, without congestion that we see around, mostly in my travels, around Harrisburg, around Allentown, around Reading, um, but, but it, it, gets, it gets further if we, don't, if we don't have the capacity to do that. So I thought it was, I'm glad you brought that up because that was an important point to me as well. We're charging for the fuel consumption as you sit there. And if, I, if I, it takes me an extra half an hour to go what normally takes me an hour to go, that's a, lot, that's a charge as well. And I think that's important for people to realize. Now, with that, we're going to get to a little bit later I, uh, about how do we make sure that when, if people are paying more, how do we make sure that they receive those benefits. But before we get there, we were at the point where we were talking about the commission the charge. Now let's talk about some of the recommendations. You touched on two of them there, uh, where you were talking about the driver's license, extension of the driver's license, recommendation to change efficiency as well as uh, uh, to cut down the cost. Let's talk about uh, the vehicle and driver registration fees, because that would be something that my constituents will see. I'll, I'll see that as well. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and the logic behind and why you would support something like that? Well, I think that, again, it, it's, uh, it's a question of how do we charge users fairly? And part of it is, as I said, access to the system, which is your registration and license fee. For, uh, for everyone out there that's, that's paying those fees right now, they haven't changed since 1997. Now, I'll, I'll just ask you to think personally, if you're watching the show, has anything else not changed since 1997? That's 15 years ago. All we're asking on that is just to index it to inflation. Uh, from the last time it was changed. I mean, so that the people that paid it in 1997, you're paying the same rate effectively that those people did in today's dollars, um, which would increase the fees. Um, but part of the reason for, for looking at the license and registration fees, at least from the commission's perspective, was that, as you say, we're getting more fuel efficient vehicles. If we don't do something that's not tied to gasoline, you know, we're chasing our tail a little bit. I mean, we know if we do a gasoline uh, tax increase that it's going to get less revenue each year. But registration and license fees are tied to the number of vehicles on the road. So whether it's an electric vehicle, 
a natural gas vehicle, you're still paying for access. So we looked at those, looked at indexing them. The other components, I'd say the major component was, uh, I'm not sure if people are aware that there's actually two parts of the gasoline tax here in the state. One is 12 cents right at the pump, meaning when you go pump a gallon of gas, there's 12 cents on it. The other is actually at the wholesale level, meaning there we charge at a millage rate or a, a percentage of the price of gas. Now, when that law was passed, it was a great idea. It was tied as the price of gas went up, so would the revenue, which makes it inflationary, so that you're not put in the position of having to go back and adjust it as a legislator. It just goes up along with the cost of living. Right. But it was capped at a dollar a quarter in a gallon. This is back in the early 1980s when I was driving my Trans Am. So that was uh, the price of fuel for a dollar a quarter at wholesale level was, say, 215 retail. Well, 1982, who would have thought we'd ever be at 215 a gallon? We've clearly far surpassed that. The DOT gets no more money whether the price of gas is 215 a gallon or 375 a gallon. We're capped at that because of that wholesale uh, tax cap. So we recommended uncapping that over a period of time, meaning allow it to be uncapped and just flow with the market. So as the price goes up and down, so would our revenue. Uh, long term, you'd expect that would go up. Um, but that way, people would know that that percentage they're paying today is going to continue to be the same percentage going forward, which makes it simply inflationary. Right. Now, let's. what would be the effect at the pump? That's what the viewers are probably, again, shaking the TV. Mm. I'm sure with, the, right with the current price of gas, mm -hmm. I think everyone would be concerned about that. The reality is, when we do it at the wholesale level, it doesn't get fully passed on. We know that because right now, if you did a survey or a scan of a price of unleaded gas around the state, with the exact same tax structure, all right, we all, everybody in the state has the same tax structure, the price would fluctuate about 15 cents a gallon, meaning the wholesalers have to decide what they're going to price it on, on a lot of factors. What's the demand? What's the cost of shipping it to the stations? What's the adjacent state if you're close to a border? What's the price there? So the wholesale tax never gets fully passed on at the pump. That's why we actually prefer that rather than okay. at the pump. The other thing from a reform standpoint is if we take the, the 12 cent flat tax and at least roll a portion of that into the oil company franchise tax, it would make it all inflationary, which again helps combat the issue you know, I spoke about with the increasing fuel efficiency. Mm -hmm. If you make it all inflationary, that 12 cents has lost its buying power many years ago. And so I think if we can make that inflationary, that helps us as well. So there was, uh, this was capped in 1982. It was. Which is uh, further back than the first one was set in 1997, you said. Mm -hmm. So um, some of this is a fairness issue of, of and, and I think you said it the most is, uh, or the best, is pay what they were paying back in 82 or, or 97. Mm -hmm. or, or I guess we weren't paying it in 82, but that's when the cap was placed. That's set, when the cap right? was placed, correct. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an issue of, in, in today's dollars, people today are paying about half of what people did in the 1980s in taxes. Now, and, you know, where else is that happening right. in government? But when it comes to road charges uh, for our transportation system, people are being asked to pay about half of what, you know, the, the previous generation paid. Now, I'm trying to explore this issue, go through this issue with you as best as possible. You're going to have a tough time in the legislature with the current makeup the way it is to pass any tax or any fee increase. But I like a fee-based at attack on the issue better because it's more of a user fee, uh, Penn State grad as well, and economics. I should tell you, I did start out in civil engineering and then the dean of business changed my mind. He said that you'd be better in a business yeah. uh, major. So engineering mechanics didn't change your Kendrick, mind. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. They didn't come calling. Yeah. But um, so uh, you know, looking at it from a user fee standpoint, I think uh, is a, is a fair way to do things, and and I think it's something that can be viewed um, as as positive to get over this big funding challenge that we have. If the commission's recommendations were all implemented. Do you think that would, um, do, you, do you feel like that would be a good start or do you think that is the end of the game at that point? I think it's a significant start. It's, it's better than a good start, it's significant because it takes care of a good chunk of the problems. It takes care of it all, all the problem now. But uh, we also have a, a federal partner in funding and uh, we have to see what happens at the federal level. Right now the, the news is not good out of Washington. They're not solving this as well as other issues I suppose. But, uh, on the transportation side, uh, they provide funding as well. And I think that if we do the, the recommendations of the commission and then we see what happens at the federal side um, and see what happens long term on the, on the federal look at what we should do relative to this mileage issue, the fuel mileage, um, I think long term we have to get to something that's not based on fuel tax because it's not that far 
off in the future where you could envision walking into a room and saying, how many people are driving a gasoline powered car? How many are driving natural gas? How many are driving electric? And if the only one paying tax is the gasoline, that's not really fair. So we have to go somehow to mileage or perhaps more tolling that's mileage based. Um, and we'll need some leadership at the federal government on that side. So I think it's a great start. And I want to tell everybody out there watching this, I think that everybody watching this, you're the, you know, the shareholders for us as a utility company. You're part of my board of directors. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever happens, we will have a list of projects that goes with the funding for 10 years. We're calling it a decade of investment. I think if we're asking anybody out there to pay one more dime on transportation, they need to know what they're getting for it. And we'll have the list of projects and when they'll be delivered so that people know this is exactly where my money's going and this is what I'm buying. Um, and I think that's vitally important. When you're is. trying to sell an idea, whether it's internally in your company or in your department or externally as a public official, uh, because they're my board of directors, sure. you know, and I'm representing them here in the Commonwealth. And I think it's important to know that um, that that all residents will be able to point to this and say, uh, I don't like this increase or, or whatever of these recommendations we decide to implement. I might not like paying more, but boy, it looks like we're getting a value here in the 187th district in Lehigh County or, or the Lehigh and Berks corridor. Uh, which you know and I know, we've talked many times about the different transportation challenges. Route 222 in Berks uh, leading and connecting into Lehigh County. Uh, the maintenance out on 78 is important to me to make sure that we limit this, you know, the sa any safety issues that we have during any weather. Um, uh, but, but I think it's important that, and I'm glad that you said that, I think that brings a level of comfort to our viewers, and, and it does to me as well, that I need to know that uh, if we are moving in this direction on some of these recommendations, raising revenue, that all those dollars are not going somewhere else in the Commonwealth right. and that they're being fairly uh, in, in that process. And, and we're going to, we did a little bit of that during the appropriations uh, hearings where we in, talked to you about it, asked you, grilled all, all secretaries and, and you did an outstanding job there as well. And, and you know, I want to, we're coming toward the end of our program. And I also want to say that um, th there are other things. You mentioned tolling. Um, I have talked to you about uh, is now the time to issue debt to mm -hmm. go? I, I think that's what would happen in a public-private partnership situation. Should we just do that? Should we partner with a private entity and let them do it? So there's many more topics. We probably have two or three more shows together to do. Probably for a topic like this. But, uh, I, but I really appreciate you being here today. And is there anything else that... You, you know, that you want to go over as far as the, the work of this commission or just the department in general that you want to share with our viewers about what you think is important takeaway from this uh, conversation. Well, I want everybody out there to know that, that we're doing our best to modernize our agency to make sure they're confident that every dollar we get is being wisely spent. We're, we have a group called a State Transportation Innovation Council that has public and private members that we use federal highways to bring national expertise to. We're basically saying any ideas we have on the, the private sector or, or public sector side that we think could reduce our costs and deliver projects more quickly, we're going to pursue it. So I want everyone out there to know we're doing our best to continue to, to make best use of every dollar we get. If you see a problem with the road, call 1-800-FIX-ROAD. Uh, let us know. We'll get out and take a look at it and take care of it for you. So you can have input to us as well. But uh, the other methods you, you mentioned, I think the commission gave us a great blueprint for both initial revenue and then setting in the enabling legislation for both us to do more in the future, as you said, go the rest of the way, and then even to allow local governments, counties, to the enabling legislation uh, to, to raise revenue themselves. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show today, and that's all we have for to that's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Gary Day, and if you have questions about any state government matter, please feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. That contact information will be shown on the TV screen in a moment. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for Legislative Report. <music>